Last session I developed the following propositions. That Joseph Smith defined perfect as it relates to God and potential humankind as unchanging in some respects, like uh, love, being a God of miracles, sympathy as an as a element of love, and eternally self-surpassing in other respects, like creation uh, and relationship creating. He's always uh, self-surpassing in, in those aspects. This definition of perfection in view of God was radically different than the God and definition of perfection of classical theism, right, which accepted the Greek definition of uh, complete, immutable, unchanging. Um, however, in the 20th century, philosophers have argued that there is actually more magnificent intellectual content, far surpassing uh, those other systems, of, such as Thomism, um, in this, just this conception. So to many, uh, Joseph's definition of perfection is more intellectually, intellectually rigorous and has more philosophical power than classical theism. Second uh, proposition was that Joseph Smith's theology speaks directly to the need, to that need in many Christians for the development of the feminine image of God. So we talked about how it places the divine feminine on the same ontological footing as Heavenly Father um, with the Heavenly Mother and requires man and woman for human deification. So we talked about some of the, um, the ways that others have proposed uh, making room for a divine feminine and how Joseph is the most robust um, robust idea of the divine feminine that we can find um, anywhere both inside and outside of Christianity. Finally, we looked at uh, the proposition that Joseph Smith claimed to reveal a doctrine of deification uh, that was met throughout the years with calls of heresy, pantheism, and philosophical, philosophical unsoundness. However, in the past 60 years, the early Christian doctrine of deification has been re-accepted by every branch of Western Christianity. So we first looked at some of the um, early Christians that, um, that taught it, and then we, we showed how in the last 60 years, uh, from Catholicism to all the branches of evangelicalism, evangelicalism and Protestantism, that uh, human deification is now uh, coming back and, and re-accepted by them. Perhaps the, the biggest challenge that Joseph Smith poses to classical theism is um, his claim to direct revelation from God. And is, this has been implicit in everything we've talked about. So most of the time, the things that his theology is coming by way of uh, what he calls revelations rather than uh, where the theologians are um, saying this is coming from the Bible or you know how I'm thinking about the world. He is very explicit in claiming direct revelation from God. It does challenge every variety of Christian thought and at the same time serves to ground all of his additional claims. So it's a, um, one of his defining uh, characteristics. Richard Bushman states it this way, The reason for embracing the Bible was that its words had come from heaven. Christianity had smothered this self-evident fact by relegating revelation to a bygone age, making the Bible an archive rather than a living reality. Hence, Joseph aimed a question at the heart of the culture. Did Christians truly believe in revelation? If believers in the Bible dismissed revelation in the present, could they defend revelation in the past? And if revelation in the present was so far out of the question that Joseph's claims could be discounted without serious consideration, why believe in revelation in the past? Joseph was asked, for example, wherein we, the Mormons, differ from other Christian denominations. And he replied, uh, we believe the Bible and they do not. Right? What he meant by that was the Bible is revelation, and especially the apostolic parts, right? These are all um, apostles who are speaking um, and, and receiving revelation from God. So um, his idea was that we actually believe not just the content, but the idea of the Bible where other Christians do not. When he was asked on what biblical grounds the inspiration of God has been limited to the written documents that the church now calls its Bible, Joseph said, none. If the canon is closed, there is a great defect in the book, or else it would have said so. He further said, to say that God never said anything more to man than is recorded in the Bible would be saying at once that we have at last received a revelation, for it must require one to advance thus far, because it is nowhere said in that volume by the mouth of God that he would not, after giving what is there contained, speak again, and if any man is found out for a fact that the Bible contains all that God ever revealed to man, he has ascertained it by an immediate revelation, other than has been previously written by the prophets and apostles. Right? So if you since, since the Bible doesn't say it's, God didn't say he would stop speaking, that if you believe that, you are, you are yourself claiming to have to received a revelation, right? As a result of his dramatically breaking of the canon, we have a greatly enlarged canon. We added, he added 
um, well, altogether 872 pages, right, which is a tremendous amount. In many of his revelations, he records the Lord speaking in first person. So we have the phrase, thus saith the Lord, 99 times in uniquely LDS scripture. Um, just the idea of writing revelation is, is daunting. You remember the, the claim to revelation by early saints, and Joseph said, said you know, go and write one, right? And they came back and said, we can't. Um, think about writing, uh, you know, a, just a claim to fake revelation. Um, and he, he did so often and um, to, to a large extent. He also, of course, did not believe that the canon was closed after him, right? He wasn't the final prophet. We believe all that God has revealed, all he does now reveal. We believe that he will yet reveal many great important things. So he not only burst open the canon, he said that it was a requirement of Christendom, requirement of true Christians, to believe that the canon could not be closed. Right? Very, very unique claims. Now, the, the Christian canon and its formation um, was a, a long process, took a couple hundred years. Um, if you're interested in diving into details, there's a, a great um, compendium of, of different um, of different papers on the topic, both on Old, Old and New Testament, called the Canon Debate. Um, Lee McDonald, who's an uh, editor of the book, says that the quest for closure, this is talking about the, the years um, when they were wanting to figure out what book should be included in the Old and New Testament. The quest for closure spawned a corresponding quest for lists. Right? Everyone's looking for the list of the definitive books that should be included. What could be construed as lists? in ancient Jewish literature outside the Tanic. So the Sirach, these are kind of lists. <coughs> Second Maccabees, Jubilees, Philo, Josephus, and Luke. Similarly work on the New Testament canonization process look to lists in Tertullian, Isibus, the Mauritarian fragment. This is famous for being the first, um, just a fragment, but the first thing that contained all 27 of what is our current uh, New Testament. So it's called the, and it was about 200 AD uh, when, when that came. So, uh, these are all lists. Athanasius' Easter letter, which which talks about books that are received as canonical by the by the people, right? So, and they were they were looking for a way and which books a way to close the canon and which books should be included in that canon. Such lists were taken to indicate closure for all of Judaism or all of Christianity, instead of reflecting the distinctive purposes of a particular school or faction at a specific time, right? So uh, a list, they differed. And so instead of taking the list of, here's what our community views as uh, revelation, they were taken as closure for all of Judaism or all of Christianity. Ancient lists or perceived lists that contradicted or failed to support eventual official canons could be ignored as uninformed or irrelevant to the quest, right? So that's how you get rid of the lists that uh, don't agree with the current canon. Even after the discovery of the Nag Hammadi documents, which we've talked about, we talked about Nag Hammadi documents, right? The Gnostic Gospels, the Gnostic texts, the Judean Desert Scrolls, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls, and many New Testament Greek papyri, the consensus tended to hold on despite questions raised by the new discoveries, right? We started to find all these um, extra biblical texts in the last century. So most agree that closure or acceptance of an authoritative list of writings occurs somewhere in the 3rd century. Uh, somewhere, like we said, the Muratorian fragment is about 200 AD. So somewhere in there, we get this kind of final closure of, um, of the canon. Now, this, because of this, of course, for thousands of years, a closed canon, the first recorded reaction to the Book of Mormon, even before its publication, was a headline in the Rochester Daily, Blasphemy, Book of Mormon, right? Alias the Golden Bible. Of course it's blasphemy because it's claiming, we don't care what it says, it's claiming to be a revelation. It cannot be true, all right? When Warren Isham, a Presbyterian editor, received a copy of the Book of Mormon, he described it as, quote, a volume of silly imposture and denied that it could be a new revelation since, in his words, a new revelation was not needed. Everything essential to our salvation was already revealed. Furthermore, a new revelation was not expected. The Christian world had settled into the belief that no further revelation would ever be made to mankind. Right? Close canon. Uh, what's happened since? Uh, writing in 2002, so right, we're now a decade removed or more. Um, Lee McDonald, James Sanders, in their introduction to this book, write, In the last 40 years, interest has been growing, not only in the origins of the biblical canon, but also in its development, continuing viability, and future as a fixed collection of sacred writings. Right? So we finally get some questioning 
of this closure process in the last 50 years or so. Uh, this is um, in one, this is from one of the papers in the book by James Vanderkam. He says the thesis I would like to defend regarding the Second Temple period is that while there were authoritative writings, and these were at times gathered into recognizable groupings, right, like the Law and the Prophets and others, the category of revealed literature was not considered a closed and fixed one, at least not for the type of Judaism for which we now have the most evidence, the people of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right? So we find the Dead Sea Scrolls, these people do not believe in a fixed canon. Right? They have what they, what they call a teacher of righteousness, um, essentially their prophet. Okay? So for the people we have the most evidence for, they do not believe in a fixed canon. This is in line with their documented belief that Revelation was not confined to the distant past, but continued in their time and fellowship. So about the teacher of righteousness, it is said that to him, God made known all the mysteries of the words of his servants, the prophets. Right? So this community, what we think are Essenes, most people think, of Judaism, this this branch, believes in, in living revelation. Um, regardless whether that gift extended to others, the text is clear that revelation continued at least in the teacher's time. Whether others who did not belong to the Qumran community's persuasion would have agreed that divine disclosures occurred in the present, we do not know, with the exception, of course, of the group of Jews who followed Jesus of Nazareth. Right? Those Jews did not believe that the canon was closed either. Right? So, for the people that we have the most evidence for, the Jews we have the most evidence for, and for the people that follow J Jesus, we know that at least at the beginning of the common era, they have no notion of a closed canon. They believed in, in continuing revelation. Thus, at the common era, we cannot speak of a canon in the sense of a well-defined number of holy writings, at least not for Judaism as a whole. How about the New Testament? In regards to the strong renewal of interest in and research on the so-called New Testament Apocrypha, at least one scholar has proposed completing work on, quote, the complete New Testament, containing the entire library of early Christian texts. Right? So they're starting to question, at least some are starting to question um, the New Testament canon as well. James Barr remarks that the notion of a finite, strictly defined biblical canon is itself an extra-biblical conclusion, right? Very, we're going to get the same argument that Joseph Smith made here. For evidence about what was within the canon, one had to go outside the canon itself, since there was no scriptural evidence to decide what were the exact limits of the canon. John Barton, people of the book, Authority of the Bible, agrees. He refers to the curse of the canon, the oft-repeated saying British scholar Christopher Evans used in describing the downsides of having a closed canon. According to Evans, says Barton, it was a fateful day when the church decided to rule a line under the last book to gain entry to the Bible and declare the canon of Scripture closed. Both Burr and Barton agree that the modern notion of a cemented closed canon does not cohere with how the earliest Christians viewed their own collection of Scripture. Um, I really like the, um, the last... Uh, last paper in this by uh, Lee McDonald himself. He, in his final remarks, he poses a, a number of questions. He actually doesn't answer the questions, uh, but he's, he thinks they're really serious and should be taken seriously. Uh, we had some email dialogue with him about them, and um, so I'm going to just read the questions again without... He has no conclusions with them or no answers, but the first one, he says, is the most important one. These are all quoting him. It's whether the church was right in perceiving the need for a closed canon of scriptures. If the term Christian is defined by the examples and beliefs passed on by the earliest followers of Jesus, then we must at least ponder the question of whether the notion of a biblical canon is necessarily Christian. Right? They did not have such canons as the church possesses today, nor did they indicate that their successors should draw them up. That's his first question. Number two, second one must ask whether in fact the present biblical canon has not legitimized practices that the church today uniformly reject namely the practice of slavery or the inferior, inferiority and subjugation of women. Um, he quotes uh, another scholar who explains that there never has been an evil cause in the world that has not become more evil if it has been possible to argue it on biblical grounds. Um, he argue, argues specifically about slavery. They argue that uh, the practice would have died out much quicker if there wasn't found implicit um, argumentation for it from, from the Bible. Right. So there's this notion that... Um, how are you, we're, you're, if you're stuck by the practices in the past, can the church move beyond those uh, things that are uh, now we you know we disagree with? Third, such did such a move toward a closed canon of scripture ultimately and unconsciously limit the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in the church? 
Does God act in the church today and by the same spirit? On what biblical or historical grounds has the inspiration of God been limited to the written documents that the church now calls its Bible? Fourth, in regard to the Old Testament, should the church be limited to an Old Testament canon by which Jesus and his first disciples were clearly not limited? Right. Fifth, if, if apostolicity is a, still a legitimate criterion for canonicity, should the church today continue to recognize the authority of the non-apostolic literature of the New Testament? If the Spirit's activity was not considered to be limited to apostolic documents, can we and should we make arguments for the inclusion of other literature in the biblical canon? He talks specifically about the epistle of Hebrews, which uh, many church fathers didn't think was written by Paul, but was included. Six, one must surely ask about the appropriateness of tying the church of the 20th century to a canon that emerged out of the historical circumstances in the 2nd to 5th centuries. How are we supposed to make the experience of that church absolute for all time? The Bible as closed canon is not accepted on the authority of the biblical writings themselves, but on the decisions of a collection of church leaders hundreds of years removed from the time of Christ. Thus, the legitimacy of a closed canon rests heavily on one, how you answer this question. Was the church in the Nicene and post-Nicene eras infallible in its decisions or not? Right. Finally, if the Spirit inspired only the written documents of the first century, does that mean that the same Spirit does not speak today in the church about matters that are a significant concern. For example, the use of contraceptives, abortion, liberation, ecological irresponsibility, irresponsibility equal rights, euthanasia, on and on. Nuclear, global genocide, and so on. On the one hand, says MacDonald, all contemporary churches have essentially closed their biblical canons, claiming that God has spoken through prophets of old, and they wrote down what was communicated to them. On the other hand, however, there is no way to argue biblically or theologically that the biblical canon is closed, if there is still the activity of God among us. If this, still, if this is still the age of the Spirit, there is little argument theologically to say that God has stopped speaking. Um, he said this in an email uh, to us. He, he said that we could publish it, though, so um, we're trying to share it here. Uh, this was interesting. Um, all Christians add unconsciously to the biblical canons, that is, their respective authorities of their respective communities, even though they are not, not put in such terms. Uh, we do this in the LDS church a lot, right? So most of us have heard Christians say such things as, well, Billy Graham says such and such, or citing some other well-known well -known figure who resonates well with them. The real question is, if canons are open, what are they open to? On what basis do we determine whether something is sacred and authoritative for the Christian community? Uh, he thinks the answer lies in the coherence of the new writings to, uh, to the old. Um, if it's coherent with the apostolic deposit that was passed on, um, if it does not cohere or reflect that it has already been received as true and faithful, then it cannot be, be canon. He says, I think this is a part of the matter that divides some Christians from accepting the rights of Joseph Smith and others. Namely, they are not able to see the seamless connection with the sacred tradition already received in the church. In the canon debate, the last two articles are by two very significant opposites in biblical scholarship. Robert Funk of the Jesus Seminar, who wants to have no canon in some cases, and a very restrictive canon in others and still a more inclusive canon in others. James D.G. Dunn's article is more about a canon within the canon, which is the practice of many Christians. Without theological support, they simply gravitate toward the Gospels and Paul, and largely ignore vast segments of the Old Testament, and also the New Testament. Karen King at Harvard would like to have the Gnostic Gospel of Mary included, because it includes something from a woman. The agendas of each group that wants a different canon varies, and Dunn's is the most commonly practiced, namely, ignore what does not fit well into our current <laughs> mode of thinking. Um, I think that it's too early to say that we'll have a new biblical canon that will gain wide acceptance. Any changes in current biblical canon are likely to take years to gain wide acceptance, um, and it will cause uh, considerable division, right? And then since the biblical is, com biblical is complete and not likely to change. On the other hand, it's difficult biblically and theologically to argue that what we have is all there should be. Really interesting. So what's our conclusion? Joseph Smith was heavily criticized for rejecting a closed canon. However, in the last 50 years, scholars are arguing that it's difficult both biblically and theologically to argue for a closed canon. All right. So theological problem of evil. One of the puzzles challenging thoughtful Christians is the scriptural assertion that there is, quote, none other name under heaven save Jesus Christ given among men, whereby we must be saved from Acts 4.12. Faithful Christians have no reservations in recognizing Christ as their sole source of salvation, yet how are they to make sense of the fate of the myriad souls who have lived and died on this earth, never hearing the name of Christ, nor having an adequate opportunity to accept his salvific gift? 
Do they suffer eternally? Are they forever excluded from the joy of eternal life with God? This is Thomas Morris, uh, The Logic of God Incarnate. He, this is, he calls it the scandal. This is how he, he phrases the scandal. The scandal arises with a simple set of questions asked of the Christian theologian who claims that it is only through the life and death of God incarnate in Jesus Christ that all can be saved and reconciled to God. How can the many humans who lived and died before the time of Christ be saved through him? They surely cannot be held accountable for responding appropriately to something of which they could have no knowledge. Furthermore, what about all the people who have lived since the time of Christ in cultures with different religious traditions, untouched by Christ's gospel? How could a just God set up a particular condition of salvation, the highest end of human life possible, which was and is inaccessible to most people? It is not the love of God, is not the love of God better understood as universal, rather than as limited to a mediation through the one particular individual Jesus of Nazareth? Or is it not a moral as well as a religious scandal to claim otherwise? So he, how he frames the, um, it's a soteriological, remember soteriology is um, salvation. So this is the problem of evil from salvation. Uh, this is how it's phrased in, in more logical terms. Um, it's a logically inconsistent triad, right? So, number one, God is perfectly loving and just, desiring that all his children sh should be saved. Number two, salvation comes only through an individual's acceptance of Christ's salvific gifts in this life. And three, countless numbers of God's children have died without having a chance to hear, hear about, much less accept Christ's salvific gifts, right? Um, one, two, and three um, are logically inconsistent. If he desires all his children to be saved and he's perfectly loving and just, um, and it can only come through Christ, um, we can't have all three. Consideration of this challenge, challenging issue has produced a wide array of answers from Christian theologians, ranging from restrictivism, so that's all who never hear or accept in Christ in this life are forever damned. You get things like middle knowledge here, where uh, people will claim that uh, God foreknew who would accept, and uh, if you were put in a, if you were born in a life situation where you never had a chance, well, God knew you wouldn't have accepted. Um, so you get those type of of explanations from uh, from uh, restrictivist uh, theologians. Uh, we also get universalism. So all will ultimately, through Christ, be reconciled to God and receive eternal life. Um, this is normally stated kind of like that without any sort of detail, because um, it actually is denying that second part, which is that you have to accept Christ. So uh, they'll claim that they don't know what's going to happen, but everyone's going to just be saved. So there's a lot of, uh, again, a lot of debate there. Um, Joseph Smith, right? We know it well, Joseph Smith's spirit world and vicarious baptism for the dead. Uh, this is Joseph. There is never a time when the spirit is too old to approach God. All are within the reach of pardoning mercy. There is a way to release the spirits of the dead. That is by the power and authority of the priesthood, by binding and loosing on earth. This doctrine appears glorious inasmuch as it exhibits the greatness of divine compassion and benevolence to the extent of the plan of human salvation. This glorious truth is well calculated to enlarge the understanding and to sustain the soul under troubles, difficulties, and distresses. For illustration, suppose the case of two men, brothers, equally intelligent, learned, virtuous, and lovely, walking in, the, in uprightness and in all good conscience, so far as they have been able to discern duty from the muddy stream of tradition or from the blotted page of the book of nature. One dies and is buried, having never heard the gospel of reconciliation. To the other, the message of salvation is sent. He hears and embraces it and is made heir of eternal life. Shall the one become the partaker of glory and the other be consigned to hopeless perdition? Is there no chance for his escape? Sectarianism answers none. Such an idea for Joseph is worse than atheism. Right? He understood the, the soteriological problem of evil very well. Joseph's teaching emphasized post-mortem evangelization, evangelization, evangelization of all those who did not hear the gospel message in this life in the world of spirits, hell or Hades. Uh, directly linked with post-mortem evangelization is the performing of vicarious baptisms for those who have died without this ordinance. Thus preserving Christ's injunction, except a man be born of water, or in the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He, was, he loved this doctrine. Listen to how joyous he is about this. Now, what do we hear in the gospel which we received? A voice of gladness, a voice of mercy from heaven, and a voice of truth out of the earth. Glad tidings for the dead. A voice of gladness for the living and the dead. Glad tidings of great joy. Let your hearts rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Let the earth break forth into singing. Let the dead speak forth anthems of eternal praise to the King Emmanuel, who hath ordained before the world was, that which will enable us to redeem them out of their prison. For the prisoners shall go free. All right. He loved this, um, this idea, this revelation. 
He concludes, a view of these things reconciles the scriptures of truth, justifies the ways of God to man, places the human family upon an equal footing, and harmonizes with every principle of righteousness, justice, and truth. Um, Later uh, holders of his uh, prophetic call, um, namely Joseph F. Smith, uh, received further instruction on this. On October 31st, Joseph F. Smith presented to the general authorities of the church a written account of what he said was a vision of the descent of Christ into hell received four weeks earlier. Um, according to James Talmadge, uh, by united action, the Council of the Twelve, the counselors in the First Presidency and the Presiding Patriarch, accepted and endorsed the revelation as the word of the Lord. The vision was then first published in December 1918. Um, in April 76, so a long time later, it was added to the Pearl of Great Price and then subsequently moved to Section 138 of the Doctrine and Covenants. According to Gordon B. Hinckley, it is a document without parallel. Classical theism has this notion of a descent of Christ, right, to, the, to, the, to hell. Uh, 1 Peter 3.19, very famous, because Christ being put to death in the flesh, quickened in the spirit, in which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Um, we don't get a, you know, a ton of information, but it's certainly there. The Apostles' Creed is dated as early as the 2nd second, second century, and it says this, He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He sent into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, the Apostles' Creed is still... Um, part of the baptismal liturgy of the Roman Catholic, Anglican, and Lutheran churches. Right? So, and it does contain that, uh, he descended into hell phrase. Um, when did this idea get rejected? Um, in later centuries, ideas concerning post-mortem evangelization shifted. Augustine, writing the early 5th century, marks this turning point. We've seen where he was a turning point in other doctrines, right? He's very influential. We, um, He's, as Trumbauer, as a, one scholar notes, by the time he wrote The City of God, Book 21, in the mid-420s, he had formulated what would become the clear position in the West, rejecting all forms of posthumous salvation. Among Roman Catholic circles, his ideas remained highly influential. A solid doctrine formed in Roman Catholicism that upon one's death, an immediate, unalterable decree was made concerning one's salvation. Right on death, right? So uh, if you hear of purgatory, uh, just as a... A note I put in here. Purgatory is a place where those who have already been saved are purified prior to their attainment of heaven, right? So there's no evangelization in, in purgatory. That's The Catholic doctrine is um, immediately on death you are assigned uh, something. Uh, reformers also rejected the descent of Christ into hell. So we have John Calvin that says, uh, th- Though this fable has the countenance of great authors and is now seriously defended by many as truth, it is nothing but a fable. Right, so um, Protestant reformers also reject Christ's ascent into hell. Martin Luther, right, Calvin and Luther, the existence of a purgatory and of a limbo of the fathers, in which they say that there is hope and a sure expectation of liberation. These are figments of some stupid and bungling sophist. (laughs) (laughs) So perhaps by this reason, by the 17th century, the descent into hell as a topic of discussion in literature and as a subject of visual representation had virtually disappeared, even in Roman Catholic art, and the descent into hell des- descended, if not into limbo, into oblivion. Nice play on words there. Um, so even as late as the 1960s, this is an interesting um, anecdote Millard Erickson writes about. Um, the chaplain of Wheaton College decided that a series of chapel messages on the Apostles' Creed would be desirable. Remember, that included that phrase. Members of the Bible department were asked to preach, each on a different phrase of the creed. No one, however, was willing to preach on, quote, descended into Hades, because no one believed in it. Therefore, that phrase was omitted from the series. Hmm. Until the second half of the 19th century, when certain Protestants considered the idea, little debate for postmodern evangel- evangelization took place. So in the 1830s, when Joseph was putting out his revelations concerning the redemption of the dead, he found himself treading on doctrine ground that had been practically untouched for more than a thousand years. Numerous conceptions, um, so now we're getting the scholarship since Joseph. Um, numerous conceptions of posthumous rescue found their way into the earliest Christian speculations. An implicit universal salvation in Romans, vicarious baptism on the dead, 1 Corinthians of course, talk of proclaiming the gospel among the dead, 1 Peter, the dead apostles baptizing the righteous dead, that's found in the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, early Christian document, 
and even God's granting the righteous the privilege of saving some of the damned at final judgment. So again, there's been, um, as we've seen in other doctrines, a re-examination of the earliest Christian ideas in regards to posthumous uh, salvation and uh, post-mortem evangelization. Post-mortem evangelization continued in the writings of early Christian thinkers, such as Clement, who we talked about, and Origen. A general concern for the dead and belief in Christ's visit and the release of dead souls from hell was very popular early Christian conviction. It was taken, John Sanders says that it was taken for granted by A.D. 150. It's evident from the fact that heretics, Marcion and Valentinians, who were criticized for most of their beliefs by the early church fathers, were not challenged at all on this point. Both the early church fathers and the heretics agreed that Christ descended into hell. Even the cautious Tertullian, we talked about Tertullian, accepted the doctrine without squabble. Even in the Arian controversy, again much later, mid-4th mid century, both sides agreed on the descent into hell. It can be concluded from this that the doctrine of Christ descent into hell and the release of souls therefrom was well established by the end of the 1st century. Uh, the Gospel of Nicodemus, anyone read the Gospel of Nicodemus? No? Um, it purports to give an account of Jesus' descent into hell. It is actually a union of two distinct works. One is the Acts of Pilate, and the other is Christ's descent into hell, um, put together the, the Gospel of Nicodemus. Um, Christ's descent gives an account of the events surrounding the visit of Christ to the world of spirits by two resurrected persons. So recall in Matthew, um, when they talk about the resurrection, that many saints were, were, um, uh, were resurrected and they appeared to people in Jerusalem. So what the Gospel of Nicodemus claims to be is two of those resurrected people coming to Jerusalem and telling their story about what happened uh, when Christ came to hell. Uh, according to J. A. McCulloch, uh, who wrote a great study of this doctrine in, in 1930, it is in fact an original document. It is, its doctrine of the descent is not Gnostic, but Catholic, and comes from Orthodox doctrine. Talking about this, uh, uh, this text. Um, so as a result of Joseph Smith's vision, since 1918, the world has had two documents purporting to do the same thing. Both documents profess to correctly report actual events that took place almost 2,000 years ago in a place that by definition no living person has ever been, namely Hades. Um, I'm going to give you a comparison of these two documents. It's fascinating. Um, both Smith's vision and the descent begin prior to Jesus' appearance in the spirit world. According to both documents, the righteous dead were aware of Jesus' imminent advent and gathered together into one place. So first we have DNC 138. All right? uh, this language might be uh, familiar to you. I saw the host of the dead, both small and great, and they were gathered together in one place an innumerable comp company of the spirits of the just, right? who had been faithful in the testimony of Jesus while they lived in mortality. This is Christ's descent in the Gospel of Nicodemus. And then all the saints all running together to Father Adam, were crowded in one place. And our Father Adam, gazing on all that multitude, wondered greatly whether all them had begun from him into the world. Uh, there's three different versions of this, so I put them, like this is Latin two um, different versions of When they heard this, all the multitude of the saints exulted more. So there was a multitude of saints here. Um, and then Latin one just says, in the place of Adam, his sons, my just ones. Again, this idea of just, um, all gathered together in one place. According to both Smith's vision and the descent, amongst this vast congregation were many of the persons known to modern Christians through ancient writ. So we have in DNC 138, among the great and mighty ones who assembled in this vast congregation, Joseph F. Smith says that he sees uh, Father Adam, Ancient of Days, Mother Eve, Abel, Seth, Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Elias, Malachi, Elijah. Christ's descent says, then the holy patriarchs and prophets began to mutually recognize each other. Uh, it also names Adam, the father of all the human race, our mother Eve, the prophet uh, Micah, Seth, John the last of the prophets, David, Abraham, and the patriarchs. Enoch, Jeremiah, Esaias, the prophet. Uh, anyway, they're all, that's kind of messed up, but um, again, um, names spe specific of people from the Old Testament. Gathered together, these prophets and righteous saints begin to talk about their deliverance, rejoicing in the fulfillment of their mortal prophecies. So we have in 138, uh, they were filled with joy and gladness. And while they waited, they conversed, rejoicing in the hour of deliverance. And then you'll notice they start Isaiah, who declared by prophecy, Ezekiel by prophecy. So we, Joseph Smith starts naming uh, the prophecies of, of, these, uh, of these, these old prophets. And the descent in the Gospel of Nicodemus 
Then Father Adam, hearing this, cried with a loud voice, exclaiming, Alleluia, which is interpreted, the Lord is certainly coming. All the saints hearing this again exulted in joy. So they're, again, exulting in joy. Um, they exulted more. Then they began to mutually recognize each other and each to quote his prophecies. Again, very similar to Joseph F. Smith's stating the prophecies. Conversations are interrupted. According to both the vision and the descent, the righteous spirits are interrupted by Jesus himself, who appears in bodily form. Right? So from verse 18 and 138, while this vast multitude waited and conversed, rejoicing in out of the hour of their deliverance from the chains of death, the Son of God appeared, declaring liberty to the captives. And the descent, while David was thus speaking, so David gets interrupted in the descent. We don't get who specifically got interrupted. And got to ask Joseph Smith for some important <laughs> detail there. There came to Hades in the form of a man, the Lord of majesty, and lighted up the eternal darkness, and burst asunder the indissoluble chains. And the aid of the unconquered power visited us, sitting in the profound darkness. Um, and immediately with these words, the brazen gates were shattered, the iron bars broken. The king of glory came in the form of a man. This is the Greek version. All the dark places of Hades were lighted up. Um, both accounts have both pre preceding and current, concurrent with Jesus' appearance. Um, there's mention of this, uh, this light, this radiant light. So Joseph Smith says, Their countenance is shown. The radiance from the presence of the Lord rested upon them. And they sang praises. Um, the descent it says that uh, there appeared a golden heat. Another manuscript has a color hue of the sun and a purple royal light shining upon us. At the hour of the midnight there rose a light as if of the sun in the Greek. And suddenly there was shown upon us a great light. And Hades, the gates of death, trembled in the Latin too. Who art there who shed us a divine and splendid and illuminating light upon those who have been blinded by the darkness of the sins. Light is from the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, about whom I prophesy. Every knee shall bow. So upon seeing Jesus, the spirits of the just bow in adoration. Joseph Smith says that they rejoice in their redemption and bowed the knee and acknowledge the Son of God as their Redeemer and deliver from the death and chains of hell. Christ ascended the gospel of Nicodemus. Adam fell down at the knees of the Lord and with tearful entreaty praying said with a loud voice, I will extol thee, O Lord. Then Mother Eve in like manner fell forward at the feet of our Lord and was raised erect. In like manner also all the saints of God falling on their knees at the feet of the Lord said with one voice, Thou hast come, O Redeemer of the world. And so all the saints rejoiced and bowed the knee and acknowledged the Son of God. They sing, the spirits break forth in song in both versions. Um, they sing praises unto his holy name. Verse 24, 138, Gospel of Nicodemus, they sing Alleluia continually, rejoicing together. Adam speaking, sing praises to the Lord, all his saints, and confess the memory of his holiness. So they, they sing some hymns. According to both these documents, Jesus was not concerned solely with those who had been righteous while on earth. Both proclaimed that from the time of his visit onward, hell could not retain any person that had received forgiveness of their sins. Um, we know this... Um, but when, when the wicked he did not go, right? But 138, we know this fairly well. He sends his, um, uh, he sends, uh, his representatives out to preach the, the gospel to them. In Christ's descent in, uh, in the gospel of Nicodemus, it says that then all the saints of God asked the Lord to leave as a sign of victory the sign of his holy cross in the lower world, that its most impious officers might not retain as any offender any whom the Lord had absolved. Right? And so it was done. The Lord set his cross in the midst of Hades, which is a sign of victory, which will remain even to eternity. So they say, there's this notion, again, it's not as specific as the Gospel of, uh, or excuse me, as 138. Um, but it says that uh, they could not retain any offender whom the Lord had dissolved. Um, see, Latin 1 has, thy sinners who has brought them back into the grace of paradise. Um, and we have been... It, Latin 1 actually ends up being baptized. These guys were baptized in the Holy River of Jordan, receiving each of us white robes. These, um, in that version. So a little bit more muddled in terms, of, uh, in terms of the preaching there. Many of the early church fathers believed that Jesus' main purpose in going to hell was to evangelize. Right? So Ignatius writes, The prophets were expecting him as their teacher, and for this reason whom they rightly expected, when he came, raised them from the dead. Just a martyr. Lord God remembered his dead people of Israel and descended to preach for them that lay in their graves. The prevalent understanding of the purpose of Christ's mission to Hades is that he undertook to preach the gospel to those who waited in darkness. I'm a scholar. 
The announcement of the good news of salvation in Hades forms the earliest and most widely diffused conception of the purpose of the presence of Christ's soul in Hades. In the words of Hippolytus, Christ is, quote, the preacher to the dead. All right? So they, uh, they understood the purpose of his descent. What are our conclusions? Joseph Smith's theology of post-mortem evangelization and vicarious baptism dissolves the sociological problem of evil. All right? there, is no, there is no problem uh, if everyone has a chance. Postmortem number conclusion two. Postmortem evangelization was accepted by the earliest Christians. Was cemented by um, as early as 100 A.D. Number three is recorded by Joseph Smith. The NC 138 represents a remarkably condensed amalgamation of the three versions of the descent of Christ into Hades. Number four. Furthermore, the descent serves an, as an orthodox Christian corroborating witness to many distinctive LDS doctrines, including the nature of the spirit world. Right, both. Uh, righteous and, and wicked are there. Um, they're in bodily form, spirits, the role of Adam. Um, we didn't go over this, but in, in most of Christian theology, Adam is a sinner, will spend eternity in hell for his role in the, in the Garden of Eden. Um, of course, the, the descent has him uh, as leading the human family and first to, see, to meet Christ, as does uh, uh, Joseph Smith's vision. Um, Old Testament gospel dispensations, they know of Christ, right? Joseph Smith said that these, these Old Testament prophets knew of Christ, right? That he wasn't something new. And of course, in the descent, they all know he's coming, right? And most especially post-mortem evangelization. Baptism for the dead. Uh, the 20th century has witnessed a tremendous proliferation of a belief in eschatological evangelization among theologians and biblical commentators from diverse traditions. Remember when Joseph talked about it no one had talked about it for thousands of years. 20th century now, everyone's re-examining the idea. Millard Erickson is considered the wider issue of the fate of the unevangelized as one of the burning issues of the present day. This is um, uh, Millard Erickson. Only recently have Orthodox or Evangelical Christians expressed interest in post-mortem evangelization, which, for most of its earlier history, has existed virtually on the fringes of Christianity. I guess Mormons are fringes. It's, it's, we'll take that if we can be Christian. Sanders points out, if one holds one, that salvation is universally accessible, two, that explicit knowledge of Christ is necessary, and three, the only reason anyone is condemned to hell is for rejection, then it is not unreasonable to conclude that the unevangelized must receive some kind of opportunity after death to respond to Christ. Further, it is argued that postmortem evangelism provides the best answer as to how God makes salvation universally accessible. It has tremendous theological fit. When accompanied by the controlled beliefs of God's universal salvific will, the necessity of faith in Christ for salvation, the necessity that one hear about Christ in order to have that faith, and the fact that God is loving, just, and fair. Furthermore, it makes use of a long-standing belief in Christ's descent into hell and the release of certain souls there. It provides a means to hold up Jesus Christ as a universal Savior without succumbing to universalism. In the last century, more and more biblical commentators are affirming that Christ did, and pre did indeed preach the gospel to disembodied spirits who had the choice of accepting his me message, and he lists a ton of, um, of 20th century people that uh, are now accepting this view. Conclusion, when Joseph Smith revealed post-mortem evangelization, no Christian community accepted the doctrine, and it had laid dormant for more than a thousand years. However, it is now agreed upon that the earliest Christians taught the idea, and within the last century, more and more biblical commentators are affirming that Christ did indeed preach the gospel to disembodied spirits who had the choice of accepting his message. Recall that in Paul's great defense of the physical resurrection, he mentions almost in passing those which are, quote, baptized for the dead as further proof of his argument. This uh, one passage has received more than 200 variant readings of this one that one, uh, one verse. Because it causes a lot of problems theologically, right? Here's Jeffrey Trumbauer. Enormous vats of ink have been emptied in both pre-critical and critical scholarship, speculating on precisely what those Corinthian Christians were doing, why they were doing, and Paul's attitudes towards it. I agree with uh, scholar Reese and Hans Kohlsman, for that matter, with Mormon prophet Joseph Smith that the grammar and logic of the passage point to a practice of, living, of a living person for the benefit of a dead person. Right? 2001. 
Another, two other scholars, uh, they wrote a whole book, 1 Corinthians New Translation, and speaking about this passage, uh, the allusion to the idea and our practice of baptism on behalf of the dead is unique in, the new t- in this New Testament passage. Close inspection of the language of the reference makes all attempts to soften or eliminate its literal meaning unsuccessful. An endeavor to understand the dead as persons, this is one of the very reasons, right? Variant readings. To understand the dead persons as who are dead in sin, right? Bapt- those who are baptized, people have said, oh, they mean dead in sin. It does not really help, right? For the condition offered if the dead are not being raised at all makes it clear that the apostle is writing about persons who are physically dead. It appears that under the pressure <coughs> of concern for the eternal destiny of dead relatives or friends, some people in the church were undergoing baptism on their behalf in the belief that this will enable dead to receive the benefits of Christ's salvation. Paul remarks about the practice without specifying who or how many are involved without identifying himself with them. He attaches neither praise nor blame to the custom. He does take it as as an illustration of faith in a future destiny of the dead. New Testament scholar Leon Morris Morris in the Tyndale New Testament commentaries expresses a very similar sentiment. This reference to baptism for the dead is a notorious difficulty. The most natural meaning of the expression is that some early believers got themselves baptized on behalf of friends of theirs who had died without receiving that sacrament. He says, uh, thus Perry says, the plain and necessary sense of the words implies the existence of a practice of vicarious baptism at Corinth, presumably on behalf of believers who died before they were baptized. He stigmatizes all other interpretations as evasions, wholly due to the unwillingness to admit such a practice, and still more to a reference to, to it by St. Paul without condemnation. Right? So there's this increasingly um, acceptance of this the plain understanding of this verse that um, all other interpretations are evasions. Gordon Fee, just to pound it in, the normal reading of the, of the text is that some Corinthians were being baptized, apparently vicariously, on behalf of some people who had already died. It would be fair to add that this reading is such a plain understanding of the Greek text that no one would have ever imagined a various alternatives were it not for the difficulties involved. Right? So that's, I think, pretty honest, um, a pretty honest view of it. Uh, Tertullian um, uh, it, uh, uh, gives us further evidence. In one of his earliest works on the resurrection of the flesh, he, dis- def- he discusses baptism for the dead. After quoting the passage, he states, Now it is certain that they adopted this practice. With such a presumption as made them suppose that vicarious baptism would be beneficial to, to the flesh of another in anticipation of the resurrection. So Tertullian um, Early on, thinks they were doing it. However, in a later work, when he's writing against Marcion, remember Marcion was a, a heretical sect, he reinterprets the verse, explaining that to be baptized for the dead was really only be baptized for the body, because it is the body which becomes dead. So it seems he's trying to recant his, his earlier statement um, and deny that vicarious baptism for the flesh of another ever occurred. Um, Jeffrey Trumbauer notes that it is significant that Tertullian only makes these moves when he's combating the Marcionites, leading me to conclude that between the writing of that of On the Resurrection and Against Marcion, he had learned of their acceptance of the practice um, some 200 years before he received full reporting by John Chrysostom. So this writer told us in current they were also baptizing for the dead. So the Marcionites, he thinks, were baptizing for the dead, and that's what got Tertullian to change his interpretation, right? He's trying to discredit these, these heretics. Tertullian's remarks thus provide good evidence that the Martianites were practicing baptism for the dead as early as the late 2nd or early 3rd century, a rite that continued until at least the early 5th century. Right? So we have sporadic po- pockets of baptism for the dead um, for num- hundreds of years. Further, the writer now, we now know as Ambrose, Ambrose Yaster, we don't really know who he is, writing in the latter half of the 4th century, um, he substantiates Tertullian's initial confirmation. In his famous commentaries on the epistle of uh, Paul, he notes that some people were at that time being baptized for the dead because they were afraid that someone who was not baptized would either not rise at all or else merely be ordered to be condemned. He clearly affirms the practice and argues that Paul refers to such work in his epistle. All the scholars have difficulty ascertaining his identity. Um, again, it's further evidence that some Christians in the early centuries continue to read that as a vicarious ordinance work. McCulloch cites baptism for the dead as one of the three prominent traditions in line with the tradition of Christ preaching in Hades. For example, according to the Shepherd of Hermas, both preaching and baptizing took place in Hades. Furthermore, according to the epistle of the apostles, Jesus tells of his offering of baptism to the righteous dead. Quote, I held out my hand, held out to them my right hand, and the baptism of life and remission of forgiveness of all evil. 
as I did to you and to them that believe on me. All right, so we have um, baptism for dead in a number of early Christian documents, and it, it, it sprang from his descent into hell. Our conclusion is that there is evidence both biblically and post-biblically that some of the earliest Christians practiced vicarious baptism for the dead at least into the early 5th century A.D. All right. Finally, the problem of evil. Um, nothing challenges the rationality of our belief in God um, or, trust, or tests our trust in Him like uh, human suffering and wickedness. And I just tried to like start thinking like of the, the worst of things that we've done to each other. Um, Holocaust, Auschwitz, Belsen, um, oh, that was supposed to be Kosovo, right? Oklahoma City, Bonnie, Sandy Hook, um, killing of children, the Armenian Genocide, 9-11, all the world wars, the Spanish Inquisition, the Wanda Genocide, I mean, on and on and on, right? Um, the, the amount of evil in the world is um, almost unimaginable. Uh, few, if any, will escape the deep, angu deep anguish, for it is apparently no respecter of persons and comes in many guises arising out of our experience of incurable or debilitating diseases, mental illness, broken homes, child and spouse abuse, rape, wayward loved ones, tragic accidents, untimely death, um, and on and on and on. So it's not, just, <laughs> it's not just these other things that other people have gone through. It's things that we all go through um, personally, if uh, even in our... Um, Relatively lucky state. All humans have struggled or will likely struggle in a very personal way with the problem of evil. So the logical problem of evil is the apparent contradiction between the world's evil and an all-loving, all-powerful creator. Here's how the ancient, and it's, right, this, this problem has been stated for a long time. The ancient philosopher Epicurus claimed the contradiction as a logical dilemma. Either God is unwilling to prevent evil or he is unable. If he is unwilling, then he cannot be perfectly good. If he is unable, then he cannot be all-powerful. And this famous, whence then evil? David Hume, famous skeptic, Why is there any misery at all in the world? Not by chance, surely. From some cause, then, is it from the intention of the deity? But he is perfectly benevolent. Is it contrary to his intention? But he is almighty. Nothing can shake the solidity of this reasoning so short, so clear, so decisive. Almost every uh, work by atheists uses the problem of evil. And it's, it's a derivation on this same way that, that Hume uh, phrased it and Epicurus uh, phrased it. Anthony Flew um, adds in, I think, what's helpful is understanding um, classical theism's um, idea of creation ex nihilo to the problem, which uh, makes it more stark. We cannot say that God would like to help, but cannot. God is omnipotent, right? He's all-powerful. We cannot say that he would help if he only knew. God is omniscient, right? He knows, knows everything. We cannot say that he is not responsible for the wickedness of others. God creates those others, right? He creates them out of nothing. Indeed, an omnipotent, omniscient God must be an accessory before and during the fact to every human misdeed, as well as being responsible for every non-moral, uh, that's twice, non-moral defect in the universe, right? A tsunami, right? Natural disasters that, that cause much uh, suffering. He must be an accessory before and during the fact for all of this evil. So we can formulate Flew, Flew's version of the logical problem of evil as follows. One, God is perfect, God exists, is perfectly loving, omnipotent, and omniscient, and created all things absolutely. Number two, evils occur. Number three, a perfectly loving being prevents all evils it can. Number four, an omnipotent, omniscient, absolute creator can prevent all evils. Hence, all evils are prevented from one, right? God exists, being omnipotent, omniscient, and creating all things, absolutely. A perfectly loving being prevents all the evils it can. And an omnipotent, omniscient, absolute creator can prevent all evils. Therefore, hence, all evils are prevented. There's our contradiction. Therefore, evils occur and all evils are present, prevented. Right? Logical contradiction. That's the, the, the logical problem evil. Now, how do we get around this? Um... A number of theological traditions, traditions will deny number two. How do you deny that evil occurs? 
you redefine evil, right? So for the Buddhist, for example, evil is not something that's positive. It's the privation of good. It's defined as the privation of good. Um, so it's not something that positively happens. It's something in your mind that happens. Um, Christian scientism is, is very much the same thing. Um, all evils are, are a defect of the mind. They're not real. Um, I've heard, and I, when I sit through um, church lessons in class, I hear uh, Mormons uh, try and do this by saying that all evils come with some greater good. So when a discussion happens in your class and someone says, and it, how often do we have classes about the problem of evil? I would say almost every week it comes up. Why do, why do good things happen to bad people? And how do we respond? How do I hear responses often like, um, to teach me a lesson, right? What are we doing here? We're we are saying, we are denying that evil occurs. We're actually saying that all evil is actually to create some greater good, right? Um, I would say that, that that's, that's a, a disaster of a course to try and follow. <laughs> Try and, define, try and tell that to, you know, um, the baby that is, that is killed, the three sisters that suffocate in the car playing hide and seek. You know, we say, God needed her more than me. Really? You know, I'm the one with no wife and, and three kids. So we, we have all Christians, because we come from this tradition, we have a tendency to try and get away from evil occurring. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's something that's ingrained because that's what classical Christians will do. But it's something that um, Joseph Smith would suggest should not be done. So Joseph Smith's revelation suggests what, we might, what might be called a soul-making theodicy. Or ex a theodicy just means theodiki, uh, God and evil, so explanation of evil. Centered within a distinctly Christian soteriology, we've already talked about that, how he solves the, Christi the soteriological problem of evil. But both are framed within a theology that rejects absolute creation, right? We've drilled that in, that he rejects creation ex nihilo, and, re and consequently rejects the philosophical definition of divine omnipotence, which affirms that there are no or no non-logical limits to what God can do. We spent a lot of time talking about how omnipotence should be understood in Joe's theology. So contrary to classical theism, he explicitly affirmed that there are entities that are and structures which are co-eternal with God himself, right? Um, chaotic matter and intelligence and primal persons. These eternal entities have inherent properties, right? We don't have a lot of what the, the inherent properties of eternal matter are, but the fact that they are eternal means that they have some properties. They're organized, right? They're not created out of nothing. There are some properties there. We have somewhat of an understanding of, of inherent properties of humans. We talked about necessity, individuality, and the big one, autonomy, right? The self is free. So God is omnipotent, but he cannot prevent evil without preventing greater goods or ends, so making joy, eternal or godlike life, the value of which more than offsets the disvalue of the evil. So he is omnipotent, but he cannot act against the structure of eternal creatures or eternal matter, right? And um, there is this idea of a greater good, so making joy, right? Um, he, he, he buttresses that with this idea of a premortal existence, where uh, you do get to ascent to come down and face this evil, that it's not um, doesn't you know create you out of nothing and place you in this against your will. So it's sternly pure. In Mormon thought, evil is seen as a positive factor in the natural world and in human experience, and the primary meaning of human existence is found in the struggle to overcome it. It is a struggle in which the moral decisions of men make a difference and a very genuine difference, not only in their own destinies, but for the outcome of, the human, of human history and the world. The demonic factors, whether moral or natural, are given elements of the world. Are given elements of the world. Moral evil, the evil that men do, is the inevitable consequence of genuine moral freedom. Natural evil, the evil that the world does, results from the moral neutrality of the material universe. God is not ultimately responsible for either that freedom or that neutrality, right? They are among the elemental, uncreated facts of existence. But by, but by entering created, creatively into human and natural history, God struggles endlessly to extend his dominion over the blind processes of the material world and to cultivate the uses of freedom for the achievement of moral ends. It's a very, very different view of, of God in the situation. So... 
the when we change the the uh, one, two, and three here, um, you'll see that the results are very different. So in the Mormon idea, in Joseph's theology, God exists as omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly loving, and created or organized our world employing eternally existing structures and entities. Number two, evils occur. Number three, a perfectly loving being prevents all the evil he can without thereby preventing some greater good or ca causing some greater evil. Number four, an omnipotent being can do anything consistent with the natures of eternal existences. Right? So from these premises, it does not follow that all evils are prevented. Right? Rather, it's something more complex, something like this. Hence, whatever evils occur are, given the natures of, of eternal existences, either unpreventable absolutely, right? cannot be prevented by anyone. Number two, unpreventable by God, but not absolutely. B would be um, human evil. Right? Not unpreventable. I can, I can prevent myself from acting um, immorally, right? Uh, but unpreventable by God, so not, but not absolutely. Unpreventable by God without thereby preventing some greater good or causing some greater evil. Right? So the, the conclusions are much different than with the classical conception of God. Uh, the problem of evil for, um, for, for, uh, for LDS, for Mormons, if you believe Joseph's theology, again, um, it's a positive factor. Evils do occur. Um, and many of them cannot be prevented at all. And some of them can only be prevented by humans choosing differently. Some of them could be prevented by God, but not without creating, um, without preventing some greater good or causing um, some greater evil. So we do have that notion of you know, some greater good, but it cannot be extended to all evil. Right? There is some unexplained evil. Eugene England's view. On the Mormon view... There is no rational or emotional need to excuse God. He can be trusted and worshipped in full confidence. God is doing all that can be done, given the nature of things, right? Nature of the universe and humans, to help us overcome evil as we progress in the struggle with it. He in no sense created evil in order to do that, but in choosing to help us progress, God had to bring us into a condition where there were new things to learn and choices to be made. That condition unavoidably is one where evil results from our imperfections. Right? There's no need to excuse God. He is doing all that he can do. He is a fellow sufferer and, and working with us to overcome the evil that is inherent in the world and in, uh, in other humans and ourselves. Conclusion. Joseph Smith's theology dissolves the logical problem of evil. It's the most pervasive and powerful argument against the existence of a loving God. Right? Everyone that argues against the existence of God employs the logical problem of evil, and if, even if they don't know that they're doing it. Why do bad things happen to good people? Right? They're assuming that God is omnipotent and all-powerful and created out of nothing. Right? Um, even those that try and get around it, and you say, oh, God created, and he cr created people with, with freedom, right? and he wanted to create with freedom. Well, if he's all-powerful and he actually created out of nothing, guess what? He could have limited our ability to do evil to each other, right? Like, turn off the genocide knob. So there's all sorts of possible worlds where we have real freedom, but, like, our natural base instincts are, like, a little bit kinder. There's all sorts of worlds that are possible like that. Um, and, and, again, why would God create out of nothing something that's just so pervasively, so pervasively evil? We'll get to, I want to finish, but uh, we'll get to the fact that uh, um, the problem of atonement, which is, very much tied into this. Why would God create a world where uh, the only way to save it was to kill his innocent son in a, an imaginably horrible way? Um, it's unexplainable in the classical theistic view. Um, so Joseph's theology allows a Christian to trust and worship God in full confidence that he's doing all that can be done given the nature of things to help us overcome evil as we progress in the struggle with it. This to me is um, one of the strongest... Um, Results of Joseph Smith's theology. It's one that I don't think he ever understood. He never talks about it uh, explicitly. It's implicit in his theology that later uh, thinkers have have put together. Uh, but it, uh, especially in our day and age, he didn't deal much with atheism. He was amongst a Christian people. Uh, but it's one that I think is the most powerful in our day and age, um, and powerful to me personally uh, when dealing with with evil that we see so much more. Right? We, we can. We can access evil and we can see it on our TV screens and read about it so much more accessible to us. Um, so let's end there. We'll finish um, 
next session with uh, atonement theory and then summation of the positive uh, uh, positive arguments, um, and we'll go on from there.